This is a promotional podcast for EIS Platforms Limited Trading as Growth Invest. Any comments made or opinions expressed in this podcast should not be construed as investment advice or a financial promotion. Startups and early stage businesses are high risk investments and you are unlikely to be protected if something goes wrong. Don't invest unless you are prepared to lose all your money. And welcome to the Alternative Thinking Podcast with Steve Dobson and Melissa Griffith. This is the podcast that takes a deeper dive into the alternative marketplace and explores topical issues. Today, we're joined by our two regular guests, Paul Matic from Mercia and the Northern VCT and Nick Priest from Downing. Hello. 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 Good summer, guys. Yeah, pretty good. Nice few holidays and apparently I'm tanned. Fantastic. Yeah, well, it's always good. Yeah, I've had a few holidays and no tan. Yeah. Definitely not tanned. <laughs> <laughs> your beard is more tanned than your head. Yeah, that's <laughs> just how I roll. <laughs> right, moving on swiftly. Um, today we're going to focus start of the new tax season and we've got obviously the autumn budget coming up on the 30th of October. Um, new government in place and I think today we're really going to sort of look at how we think Labour might tackle um, tax changes and the implications that could have on our sector. So, um, who wants to kick off a bit? I think I was thinking of starting with capital gains. That sounds like one for, for me and the EIS specifically. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so, there have been various different discussions about from the government how to fill this black hole that's a, a period of 22 billion. And uh, unsurprisingly, in some ways, and um, the new Labour government is looking to increase taxes in some ways to to then fund services of various sorts. One of the suggestions is looking at capital gains. And uh, I think most of the focus has actually been around private equity and the, the carried interest schemes, which are currently charged at the, the CGT rates rather than income tax. So I think that will be one of the areas which will be probably heavily focused upon. But there is a broader suggestion that uh, capital gains tax is charged at the marginal rate of income tax. And that's that's quite quite significant and quite interesting. Mm. And um, obviously, currently is 20 or 22, 24% CGT. And um, if you take it up to the marginal rates of tax, that would be, well, it could be 20, 40, 45, and actually even 46 in Scotland. Um, so... That's a significant increase in capital gains tax for those investors who are investing outside of ISAs, outside of pensions. But um, there is it's quite a quite a large change, and um, I don't know about you, but I think it'll be uh, quite substantial, and it will impact the different tax schemes in different ways. And I'm not sure how particular. You can tell me if I'm right, but in terms of BR and, and VCT, it might not have that much impact. But certainly, there's an ability to defer capital gains using EIS and, and SEIS and EIS specifically deferral. So it will be quite a big, interesting move that comes to pass. Yeah. Are we agreeing, Nick? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's a couple of things that I find a, a bit weird about the, the CGT conversation is, uh, firstly, uh, Rachel Roo said quite early that, that this was going to be a government for growth. Yeah, uh, and, pro growth, yeah, pro so, business. Exactly, uh, and um, you know, bringing CGT in line with income tax to me is is taxing investment in UK PLC in small businesses, um, and therefore it's the exact opposite. But but we're in a situation where where they don't really have much of a choice because they've ruled out you know tax rises on income tax, which is you know t- income tax, national insurance, uh, VAT, yeah, corporation yeah. tax. I think that adds up to nearly 75% of all the potential places they could raise money. Um, so they've kind of backed themselves into a, a corner. I, I, To be honest with you, I think when it, they, ha- they probably have to do something like that. Um, but if, in terms of the impact it has on business relief, I have, he- I have heard some people speculate that you might get rid of um, capital gains tax dying on death. So um, it would be, mm-hmm. the only problem with that is that, you know, if the inheritance tax rules don't change, then you've got capital gains tax and inheritance tax, um, I can't see that that would be too difficult for a uh, for a shadow chancellor to to pick apart in terms of double taxation. So it'd be pretty unpopular as well. I, I do wonder whether with a new government coming in, they they could 
So they've made these commitments not to increase income tax and VAT, et cetera, et cetera. But whether they might be looking to, to change their stance on that once they see this big black hole. That's that, it. That's a possibility. Yeah, that's it. I mean, and, and we've really had that telegraphed, haven't we? I mean, yeah. one thing that we've seen from the Labour Party is they learned one lesson from the previous Conservative government, which is when the previous previous Conservative government came in and they picked up the note saying there's no money left, they you know went to town on it and told everybody about the note and they told everybody that they'd been left in this situation. And, and the Labour government have done exactly the same thing this time around. They've been going around sucking their proverbial teeth, telling telling us all how it's much worse than we thought. And that, to me, sounds like a precursor to saying, well, you know, we weren't, we weren't, we, we didn't have all the facts beforehand when we made these promises. So, you know, maybe we have to change our mind. And ultimately, if they put 1p on income tax, this £22 billion hole disappears. So it's quite a simple one size fits all solution. Mm. So that wouldn't surprise me. But again, very positive for the tax efficient space, potentially as long as the products stay, because there's a lot of income tax relief options which are mm. fueling the economy. Um, in tax efficient investment. Yeah, I mean, this is this is very much Paul's area, but I, I mean, I would think that, that if you come out and proactively say you're going to be a government for growth, you you can't really do anything significant to the VCT and EIS market. And also, we've we've really only just had that that sunset clause. Um, the EU. Yeah, exactly. And so that you know. actually interesting as well. Glenn Stewart from Committed Capital wrote in the um, GBI magazine. Um, about the startup scale up making Britain the best place to start and grow, which was a Labour commissioned review in 2023, and that was very pro EIS, SEIS, um, you know, and for the economy. So they would be doing quite significant U turns in some of the um, you know reviews they've done. They haven't the said anything. That's the this is the point about it. All of this, all of this conversation we have, I think, is born about because in our world, in our market, in the advisor market, there's a lot of speculation. And there isn't anything really more than that. And and so we have to try and figure out what they're thinking. But actually on these particular issues, they haven't really said very much at all. Um so it's you know, it's a wait and see. I mean we've got the we've got the Labour Party conference coming up at the end of September. Yeah, they they've been very supportive. So Rachel Reeves and that there's a startup review back in twenty twenty two from Labour. It's all been very positive around these schemes and it is pro growth and it's the talking about growing the economy and uh, and helping us that the grow GDP to get more tax to then invest in services and it's yeah everyone can grow out of debt and that's exactly what they're looking to do and it doesn't it wouldn't make sense to negatively impact these schemes um, but uh, we haven't until we brought up the sunset clause just then and that's a bugbear of mine because it's been <laughs> well yeah theoretically on and on. Yes, it hasn't. It still hasn't been resolved, and I think that is impacting the market at the moment. And um, until it has been fully resolved, I think there will be uh, there is some trepidation in these within our markets. Well, just to confirm, what what exactly is still left to do on that? So obviously, we've had the you know ESA came out with a statement. Yep. The EU has ratified it now. They're happy, but it still needs passing, doesn't it? Yeah, the, the Treasury commencement order hasn't happened. Yeah, basically. So basically, an agreement from the government that they, they're going to do this. EU have agreed they will do, but it still hasn't happened. And legally, they're still going to finish it to uh, April 25, isn't it? It's yeah, it's quite, it's, ticket. it's quite quite soon. Yeah. So I think that is currently, uh, until that's done, which I think it will be done, finished soon, within hopefully a month or two. And I know there's a, a meeting on the, six, I think it's the 16th of September um, with the Treasury, and that might be when that uh, the Treasury commencement order is delivered or subsequent to that. And that will be kind of a, it's like a Damocles sword at the moment still. Um, but there's no, it's just operational now from, from our perspective. I think there's a little, from both EU and, and the GB, we've had agreement that this should be pushed out by 10 years. But um, until that's happened, I think the budget secondary from my perspective at the moment is very important. But until that's done, um, like there's, they'll be affecting VCT fundraisers, EIS uh, attraction. I don't, I don't think it directly affects um, BR, but it's, I think it is putting a bit of a damper on the market at the moment. Yeah, although um, we were obviously just starting the tax um, season with um, a number of VCTs and that opening, and Mobius is a very encouraging start. So, I mean, I think there is still, I mean, it, it comes back to what we're constantly saying. It, it's People are almost having to, to work out which scenarios to go for, aren't they? So some people are just going to go for it, yep. whatever. You know, you, I think you've got to believe 
that these products will be around. They are sticking and uh, and the government's going to support them. I fully agree with that. But uh, they're leaving and then there's a exactly. having legislation yeah. to that point. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, but in, in terms of the, the budgets um, end of October, that is a couple months away now. And I think that will be, yeah, if there is higher personal taxes, as we expect in some regard, and we talked briefly about CGT just then, but that will benefit the tax efficient schemes. So, um, and specifically, I, I would suggest it would be EIS more than VCT and BR, really. But um, I can talk through why that is. But uh, obviously, the tax changes we're talking about are more focused around CGT rather than income tax. Um, well, there could be the, the uh, uh, yeah, uh, the CGT, uh, the current interest moves to income tax rather than uh, CGT at a higher rate. I think that that. That's an area which I'm not totally clear. I don't know if you guys have heard what the government might do on that, but um, the, the the private equity carried interest schemes uh, kind of lower taxation at the moment, and that's they're talking about increasing that. And how they do that is is a question which is outstanding, I would say. And the impact there, obviously, people go into the private equity schemes, the GPLP structures for the higher expected returns. However, what's going to happen if there's a bigger taxation on that carried interest? What are the returns going to be? Are they going to charge bigger fees to accommodate for the, the taxes they're going to pay? And is it going to be as an attractive you know area for people to put their money? Yeah, and, and I would think that it might bring some money from PE into BC. Yeah. And whether that's VCT, EIS, or uh, other schemes, it might be BR, actually, um, from a yield play. That's, uh, yeah, I think that is a bit of an unknown at the moment, but I think it's actually quite a substantial piece of this conversation. Mm -hmm. Just going back to the sunset clause, do we think, I mean, around the table, I guess, the view is that we think it's going to get passed. It certainly feels that way. And you look, you look across Europe and a lot of uh, countries now are looking to replicate the schemes because, I mean, we had Christiana on yeah. a few podcasts ago and she talked about the merits of the schemes, both SEIS and EIS, um, you know, for UK PLC and other countries are looking in enviously to see how well they're doing. So it, to me... It just seems a formality, and it's just waiting for that. But I agree with you until it happens. Well, I, I it's okay. It's a certainty. It, 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 I'm not sure it's a hundred copy, a hundred percent, but it's not far off that. But um, you, well, specifically around VCT offers, for example, I think some people would struggle to launch an offer without knowing the future of um, the, of the schemes. And um, and there are some out there already. So maybe it's done very well. I think it's like 20, 25 million in the first day. Yep. Um, yep. They're moving fast. Um. No, I mean, my view is that I, I do think, I think it would be hard for a government to come in and remove EIS VCTs, particularly when we've also got a, um, you know, a, a marketplace which needs IPOs. It needs a bit of fuel into it. And and if you start taking this away, where's it going to come from, particularly if they're going to go carried interest in PE? I mean, there's just, you almost, it, it doesn't balance to me. I think there's got to be something driving it. And, and the best thing about the tax efficient investments are, that they actually help the the individuals setting up businesses, the entrepreneurial spirit, and this pro growth, pro business. Yeah, it's AIS VCT and NSCIS are such a powerful driver of innovation in this country. Mm. Um, it's not they're not the only funding source, but they are a big funding source, and uh, I think it, it does really stimulate the early stage uh, ecosystem. Entrepreneurs are benefiting from it directly. There's lots of evidence about individual companies and and more broadly. So, and actually, I think the UK generally is in a better position than lots of other countries around the world, including the US. Like our inflation is down, GDP is doing a bit better. So I think we're actually in a pretty good position. And I would hope we accelerate from here yeah. with our early stage startup environment starting to canter. And actually, we're, we're driving more innovation, more scale-ups as well as startups. And that's one thing which there is, where the UK is not so good at, is the scale-ups, mm -hmm. whether that's where VCT money comes in. Uh, I think we could do really well in the next five years and, and, and ahead of the rest of the rest of the world, really. But these sort of things, uh, if it doesn't happen, would really stun to us. And I think that I have a Gmail. Well, I was going to say I've got a statistic, um, which was... It's been a while since you had a statistic from Mel. This came from Stuart Beaver uh, from Casino, um, which actually was in the Sifter report. But the um, UK is leading the way in the first half of 2024 with more deals in the UK than in France, Germany and Spain. So, uh, no, no, it's just. But then, you know, on the back of that, um, the first half of 2024, the UK was the fastest growing economy in the G7 as well. You know, to Paul's point as well, having been in a technical recession in the back end of 2023. Yeah. So, I, 
I've yeah, we've done a lot of things wrong over the last decade, but I think actually we're in a pretty good possession, position to grow from where we are. And you see the footsies coming through 8,000 yeah. a while ago. I, everything is going, feels like it's going in the right direction. And inflation seems to be tamed and interest rates coming down. So this, this, it looks like we're slightly ahead of, ahead of the world, um, but not far. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I think we sort of looked at capital gains tax. Um, next, I think inheritance tax, which is obviously... That's what we're talking about. Thing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I think this is you, Nick. Okay. Thoughts? What are we thinking? What, what scenarios could we see? I mean, b- business relief was introduced by Labour back in 76. They're yeah. not going to take it away, are they? Well, I was born then. <laughs> Just so I'd let you know. <laughs> well, I'm not going to take you away. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, you're right. Actually, the business relief was introduced by Labour, and you know, generally speaking, you don't find governments getting rid of something they brought in themselves because it, you know, doesn't look great. But, um, but I think more importantly than the fact it was Labour that brought it in, I think it's the reason that it exists. You know, why why is it here? Well, it's to help. Uh, it's to help with the longevity of businesses that helped pass down succession of businesses. And I, and I guess from, from somebody like Downing's perspective, you know, where we're, where we're investing into businesses, then it's, it, it's giving a, a, it's giving a tax incentive, albeit not a tax incentive today, a tax incentive tomorrow. Um, and that, that by the way, is a really important point. Cause I think when Rachel Reeves first stood up, um, after the election, she said uh, about this budget, um, the black hole on the budget, the 22 billion pounds, she was saying, this is not, tomorrow's problem this is repeated over and over again she said this is today's problem this is this year this is 22 billion this year so we're talking about with business relief you know tomorrow's uh tax breaks but those tax breaks exist but they're what they're doing is is they're incentivizing people to invest into uk businesses both in the a market and in the unquoted market so you know we've talked around the table a number of times about uh, this being a pro growth government um you know, there are arguments to say that that, that wouldn't be pro growth, um, but I mean, let's know, let's be start up with being a bit fair to to the Labour government. They haven't actually really said that much about business relief. They've been pretty quiet about inheritance tax as well. And actually, one of the few things they said about inheritance tax, uh, well, that's actually pre-election, but they said, yeah, no, we support inheritance tax. And I remember Rachel Reeves when we had this conversation probably a year ago now. Um, the, before the autumn budget last year, uh, they were expecting the Conservative bu- you know, government to get rid of inheritance tax and there'd been a lot of speculation about it. And then when the budget happened, nothing was even mentioned. Yeah. And Rachel Reeves had all her notes out on the dispatch box and she was, you know, she went to town on the Conservative government about inheritance tax, even though they hadn't mentioned it. Um, and so, it, you know, the speculation can build with uncertainty and when you've got a new government. So the government's not really said anything uh, of note, um, but there are you know, there are people around close to the government. The IFS is is one uh, and the IFS, you know, are very close with the Labour Party. Um, and and so maybe they're somebody worth listening to. And they've made a, a few suggestions, um, mainly focusing around the AIM market, actually. So, you know, these days it's very difficult to have an opinion on on what could happen, but there are some sort of core themes coming out from the conversation. So what could they do on the AIM market? Well, they could get rid of business relief completely on AIM listed shares. Um, and how much would that affect at the AIM market? Well, look, I, I would say, say a lot. It's difficult to say for sure. There are circa 600 companies in, in the AIM market. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, the top 50 of those are trading on a 20 times PE. Uh, the rest is trading on an average of about 10. And, and just out of those 600, how many are qualifying roughly for business relief? I would say the majority. I would say, yeah, that's the, the 600 is the, is the majority of them are qualifying. There are a few more that, that are non-qualifying. So this is qualifying businesses in that order, 600. Um, but one of the, I mean, anecdotally, one of the main reasons that I think that the, those businesses are trading at the top end, the 50 that I mentioned are, are trading at such a premium, it is is probably because of business relief investment into them. So if you're if you're saying that 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 those fifty businesses that then rem- you get rid of of aim completely and those fifty businesses then lose it then then you could say well then it might be a, a re rating of those businesses back to to the ratios that we're seeing in the rest of the aim market and bear in mind that those are, might be inflated a bit as well because of some some investment to uh, through for for business relief well that would wipe off half of the value of those fifty businesses which by the way equate to half of the value of aim 
So, so the impact, on, and, and we'll probably lead to some of them delisting as well. So the impact on the AIM market by getting rid of business relief would be, I would huge. say, it'd be huge, yeah. And, and you know, the problem with that for a government is, especially, as we said, a pro-growth government, is you don't want to be a government that comes in banging on about growth and then crash a, a market. And it is known as the alternative investment market to yeah. be a place to IPO, to create opportunities, yeah. exits, etc. Well, who was the last person that, that banged on about growth and then crashed a market? That was Liz Truss. And it didn't go particularly well for her Not no, you don't want to be you don't want to have your longevity measured against the lettuce uh, and you know <laughs> they've already done better yeah so you know yeah they have already done better but you know we could just pick another salad item and oh, see how we go <laughs> but it's not a great look you know so so that's one and that doesn't seem doesn't seem particularly likely but that is a conversation that has been going on you know, in, in the corridors of Westminster. And I, I think they have to understand uh, why, you know, why is this, why are these businesses getting business relief? And and there is an argument that, that some of the larger ones that we've just mentioned maybe shouldn't get it. But I think I've given good reason why they should. Let's say that they, another option is that they cap it. So any businesses, yeah. 500 million market cap or whatever the number is, 500 million market cap and above, well, we've just said what happens to those bigger businesses, what that does to AIM. So you can still crash the AIM market like that. Um, I would like to bust in here. Yeah, actually. go for it. Well, the trouble is you may have a negative impact on AIM if you take out BR. But actually, you may have a ne- negative impact on UK GDP if you tax the carried, in- carried interest more, so MPE, so private equity. So they're, they're building businesses and growing them and helping stimulate. So if you tax them more, yeah. it's just because of the same impact. So... We have, you have to be really careful on where the taxes are increased. Cause well, this is why it's a yeah. constant balancing act, isn't it? I think. Um, There's also this other aspect of popular taxes versus non-popular. Yes. And, you, you know, they're dealing with the general public that a lot of this doesn't really touch. And I don't mean that in a condescending way, but... You know, we know in inheritance tax, for instance, it's what four or five percent of the population. Yes. But there's a big perception amongst people that it does impact them, and it's playing on that. And and you know, yeah. how people believe it, it, these taxes do impact them. Yeah, I think that's really important. But I think that's more of an election conversation, isn't mm-hmm. it? It's about what people believe versus what the facts are. Yeah, and perception versus yeah. Reality. And and I think I think we're probably out of. <laughs> hopefully, we're out of that side from that. But although I think it is important to have headlines, you know. The 22 billion is a number we've discussed. Everybody knows the 22 billion number because they've been repeating it all the time. And now what they want to do is come up with a whole load of new headlines to say, well, that takes a little bit of the 22 billion, it reduces it a little bit at a time. And But that's been controversial, hasn't it? I mean, they've recently come out with the um, fuel reductions yeah. and um, and that's sort of, I mean, I think there's definitely, there's an opinion that they're going to go for the savers, pensioners and business owners. I mean, that was something I read that they were talking about possibly Going at AIM for business relief, um, you know, some sort of changes around AIM, but actually still looking to um, have business property relief on um, the agricultural side and businesses. Agricultural relief, yeah. Well, okay, well, that moves over to the to the unquoted side a bit more then. But, I mean, I, I suppose the final thing to say on AIM would be if they, you know, if they, they mess around with AIM, even if they cap it, they will have that impact on the bigger businesses as well. But personally, from Downing's perspective, it might not be a bad thing. We invest below 500 million anyway, so it might be a boost to us. But I just don't think for the market as a whole, it is a good idea. Yep. Uh, but I suppose what you, the way I come at this is, is that, Steve, you, you mentioned about the overall amount of estates that pay inheritance tax. And I think the, the we're sort of talking 7.5 billion as well in terms of inheritance tax takes in total. But it, what's interesting is if you look at the AIM companies, the AIM exchange as a whole, they employ 480,000 people. And last year they paid 42 billion in, in taxes. So it's really a drop in the ocean. And business relief last year, 2023-24, uh, a cost of revenue 1.3 billion. So it's a tiny drop in the ocean. So you'd be crazy to do yeah. something like AIM. So let's go on then to your point, Mel, about the unquoted uh, market. Well... And we've been talking about private equity, um, and then let's let's look at some of the things these these services invest into. I mean, Downing's not dissimilar in in many ways to some of the other ones uh, in the marketplace, and do a lot of investment into development capital, into property development, into renewable energy. So, ringing any bells as to some of the things that have been mentioned by the the government as yeah. to what they want to focus on. So, this is cutting off funding to a place that they've now already said we want to put more funding into. So that that's a bit counterintuitive. Um, 
and yeah, and and then they've said maybe we could limit it to. Well, they haven't said it. People have said they could limit it to five hundred thousand pounds. Um, actually, the IFS I think mentioned that uh, that you could limit the available business relief to five hundred thousand. I mean, that is an option. It's not a great option, I don't think. Uh, it, it limits. It. What it might end up doing is is seeing business relief from an investment perspective treated in the same way as something like EIS or VCT, where it's a usable allowance. So, and if you could so that, going back to your point there, that five hundred thousand was a potential limit cap that you could yeah. invest into a business relief product. Yeah. Um, but again, but that's not been said by anybody really. I mean, the IFS mentioned it, but it's not been it's not come out of government. So this is it's not a real thing. Um, but it could, I mean, from an advisor's perspective, it could just, as I said, it could just make it an allowance. Yeah. So have you done your ISA? Have you done your pension? Have you done your VCT? Have you done your EIS? Have you done your business relief? That's it's an allowance mm-hmm. to fill. And actually, I was looking at uh, our average investor size in our service. It's about £130,000. If you consider people diversify, you might use three or four different services. That's probably not a million miles off mm-hmm. where Limited. the average is anyway. So um, it would it would mean that the larger investors who ultimately can make a bigger impact in terms of investment would be screened out. But yep. yeah. Um, so yeah, that's my view. I, I, look, ultimately as well, you could you could if nothing happens to AIM and something happens to to the unquoted market, you could uh, introduce a, an ownership test where. Um, where this is aimed, the idea of it is aimed at family businesses passing down through generations. So you could have an ownership test on unquoted businesses. Um, so having a large pool of investors might preclude them from getting a business relief. But under those circumstances, there's nothing to stop the underlying companies listing on AIM as well. So it, it probably would, it wouldn't be quite business as usual, but it business as usual if. Yeah. So, you know, there's there's lots of speculation about these different ideas, things that could be done. Um but I don't think that there's much meat on any of them. And look, uh, you heard it here first. <laughs> I suspect what's going to happen, because we've had this conversation a few times before, and we've seen it certainly over the last two budget uh, budget statements, I suspect what will happen is nothing will happen. And that would be great. The only problem with that is it kicks the can of the conversation. It's constant speculation. And we've been talking about this between the four of us in this room. I think we've been talking about it for 12 or 18 months. A business relief is a two-year qualifying cycle. If nothing happens to this budget and nothing happens to the next budget, all of a sudden you're in a situation where you have a client with an inheritance tax liability and you've been sitting on your hands because you're worried about legislation change and you've missed out on an entire... And we, we saw that as a platform, didn't we? When totally. ahead of the April budget, yep. there was a lot of people... Well, people did nothing. They just sat on their hands because there was that uncertainty and people were waiting to see what happened. And the, as you say, it just kicks the can down the road because yep. you're constantly, constantly chasing yep. and you're putting it off. Well, and I'd refer back to our podcast we did with Simon French where we were talking about, you know, one of the key things on a wider scale is that we need secure economics um, and and that that is affecting everywhere, you know, not just for us, but, you know, in the wider economic place as well. Until we actually all know where we are and we've got, you know, legislations that are sticking and they're solid, it's very hard for anyone really to know what to do. People are sitting on their hands. It, it's all speculation and who knows. I, I just, just think there's a, a few nuclear options here and, and, and a flat rate of pension relief would be a really big change and would indirectly impact our industry substantially, but I think affect the entire, well, most of the population really, and uh, the, get smaller investors and smaller savers to put more in and bigger investors to get tax more. So I think that's quite a, an efficient way to, to square a circle. Mm-hmm. I mean, Paul mentioned nuclear options. There's a couple of things you could do. I, I would argue one, this is sort of slightly facetious, but I could argue, uh, you could argue that um, you could just get a little bit better at, collecting taxes i mean it's the tax gap yeah the tax gap last year was 35 and a half billion and you know 22 billion i'm no mathematician <laughs> it covers if you just increase the you know and the tax gap for the for those people listening that don't know it's just the difference between the tax that we expect to be due versus the tax that we actually get yeah. you know and and so if we could just get a little bit better at, at closing the ta- the gap the tax gap then we would clear that deficit the other alternative, if you want to be, um, you know, I know they've ruled out income tax, but really, as I said earlier on, I feel I feel like this is a thing. It might be a U-turn. It's, it might be a U-turn. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not something we've never heard of, is it? Um, you know, you could put up, you could put up the income tax allowance for lower owners. You can, you can make it up to twenty thousand pounds, for example. I don't making these numbers up. You could put that up significantly, so you're not impacting 
uh, lower earners, um, and then you could put up income tax by a penny and you know and deal with the problem. And therefore, you're being nice to people who don't have as much money, and you're raising more tax. It ticks a lot of boxes for a mm-hmm. Labour government, doesn't it? Yeah, fiscal fiscal drag has been taking a lot of people into higher rate tax. Yes, yes. So. Uh, it's adding billions per year just in terms of inflating wages and then taking through tax banding. So that, that's not that's not an impossible approach, really, because if you increase the lower threshold and increase the rate, um, that would have the desired effect. So I haven't heard that being talked about, though. No, I just made it up. Okay. <laughs> As you know, of... that's something I like. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but they're currently in place, aren't they, till 2028? Yes. Yes, yeah, so, so we're talking about changes. Yeah, yeah you might be start... onto something, Nick. Well, there you go. We should be a politician yes. and advisor. Mm. Right. Well, I think uh, after that, I think that might be a great way to end. Thank you both Thank for you. your uh, insightful um, knowledge. Yes. And let's see what happens. And um, I'm, I think we should all regroup um, once we've had the uh, had well, budget. Yeah. Budget. Convene. See, see who got it, things right. <laughs> who got it right. <laughs> <laughs> score, score. I don't think anyone made any predictions. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, guys. And we hope to see you soon. Thanks for having us. Thanks, both. Thanks. To hear more from Steve and I, tune in to either YouTube on video or we're also available on all good podcast channels.